Hello there, and welcome to another episode of 3D Christianity. My name is John Hathaway, and I'm your host here. And today we're going to be looking at the subject of believers and disciples in Scripture and whether there is a distinction between those terms in the Bible or not. Um, now, before we get too far into the subject matter of this episode, I do just want to say a quick thank you to all of you who have subscribed to my channel, whether you're a new subscriber or someone who's been subscribed for a long time. Uh, but I do appreciate all of you. and. If you guys could just do me a quick favor and give me a thumbs up on this video and then comment at the end once um, uh, once you listen and just uh, let me know your thoughts. And then if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, I would just encourage you to do so. And also make sure to hit that bell notification because that really helps the algorithms of um, helping this channel get recognized through YouTube. And um, it helps you to see whenever new videos come out and everything like that. So um, anyway, let's go ahead and get into the subject of this episode, which is believers and disciples. Is there a difference? So you see the word disciple a lot of times in, in scripture. And a lot of times uh, words like disciple are used interchangeably, or at least it, um, seemingly interchangeably with the word believer in scripture. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit about that and uh, just exploring uh, whether or not there is a distinction between these terms or not. Because, um, and I, well, before I get into really um, why we're doing this, I'm just going to I'm going to go over some definitions and things like that. So I looked up um, some of the definitions like for a believer, the definition for that would be a person who believes that a specified thing is effective, proper, or desirable. Um, an example of that would be I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. And then the second definition would be an adherent to a particular or a, an adherent of a particular religion or someone with religious faith um, and uh, if you don't know what that word adherent means it means someone who supports a particular party person or set of ideas um, so let's look at the word disciple the disciple the definition for disciple would be one of them would be a personal follower of Jesus during his life especially one of the one of the 12 apostles so if we're going to be talking about the disciple like the disciples in scripture uh, it's usually in reference to the 12 apostles or the 12 disciples um, and then uh, a more broad definition of that word would be a follower or student of a teacher leader or philosopher now I want to make this um, I want to make this distinction real quick um, now this is this is my opinion this is not um, this didn't come from a verse in scripture or anything that says this so uh, don't just take me for out for my word as I often say on this channel but um, I want you to research these things for yourself as I always say um, but this is just something I'm going to put out there a person can be a believer a disciple or both however the words believer and disciple have different meanings they are not mutually exclusive now what do I mean by mutually exclusive um, and maybe some of you guys are like John why are, why are you explaining that we already know well uh, I'm just saying this for in case there's anyone who's uh, maybe a newer believer or someone that just uh, doesn't know a lot of these terms like I mean I can be a pretty dumb person when it comes to terminology sometimes so I want to just explain that so when something is mutually exclusive um, or something that's not mutually exclusive here's an example you could have like um, a de if you have a deck of cards and then you have a king of hearts well that card is both a king and it is both and it is also a heart so there are different 
types of cards in the deck that are there's different kings like there's the king of hearts the king of diamonds king of spades king of hearts or i already said that king of clubs i guess um and then you have all the different um you know numbers and things like that like so you could have a queen of hearts or a jack of hearts or a ten of hearts so um when you have a king of hearts though um that the king and uh, the king of hearts they're not mutually exclusive to uh, one another so the card can be both a king and it can be both a heart but that doesn't mean that um all the kings are hearts or all the hearts are kings if that makes sense i'm probably explaining this like a um like a four-year-old would explain it but um that's how my mind works so you'll just have to bear with me um anyway it kind of reminds me of michael scott on the office when someone gives him a memo or they tell him something to do and he's like can you explain this to me like I'm five? <laughs> so, yeah, I can be that way sometimes. Um, anyway, so we mentioned earlier that there was only two times in Scripture where the word believers is used. And um, so we're not going to delve too far into what the Bible says about believers uh, because there's only two mentions of it. So there's not really a lot of descriptors for that specific term of believer. But here's those references. Acts 5.14. It says, And believers uh, and believers were, were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. And then 1 Timothy 4.12 is the other reference. It says, Lo, Let... <laughs> I can't talk today. 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So those are the two times when we see the word believer used in scripture. Um, now, so I, I mean, I think a, just a reasonable definition that we can give for that word like I say because there's not um and I'm talk, talking about a biblical definition or descriptor since the bible doesn't go too far into that but a reasonable one we could give it is simply one that believes on Christ or one who believes on Christ uh, that's about as simple as you can put it um now let's look at uh, the word disciple in scripture. Now we're not going to be going into every single occurrence of the word disciple because there, I think there's close to a hundred, if not more, um, times that this word is used. And, um, so I am specifically, I'm specifically looking at the words containing the word disciple or disciples where it is giving descriptors of what disciples uh, do or what makes someone a disciple um, uh, or anything similar to that. So we're going to be looking first at Matthew 16, 24 through 27. And there's a parallel passage uh, of this in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 through 38. Uh, I'm not going to read that one. Now they're not exactly the same, but they're, um, they're pretty much the same. I think it's it's probably the same, just worded slightly different. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, that again, this is Matthew 16, 24 through 27. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in glory, uh, in the glory of his Father with his angels, 
and then shall he reward every man according to his works. So let's look at the context of this passage. And here in Matthew, in Matthew 16, whenever this is being said, uh, there's two things that, um, there's two things that happened significantly before Jesus said this. The first thing that happened is that Jesus was, um, he asked his disciples, whom, whom do men say that I am? And they, you know, they told him, like some say that you're John the Baptist, some say that you're Elias or Elijah or whatever. Um, and then he says, whom do you say that I am? And then Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, uh, yada, yada, yada. And, and I'm not trying to be, um, you know, disrespectful there when I said that, but, uh, I just, I'm not quoting it by memory. So or I'm, I'm quoting it. I'm paraphrasing it basically. Um, so Jesus, after Peter says this, Jesus kind of recognizes Peter, um, he, or quote unquote praises him. I don't, he doesn't literally praise him, but, um, in the term, the vernacular that we use today when we praise somebody for, for something good that they've done, or, uh, if they've said something, um, of value. So Jesus recognizes Peter for that statement. Um, and then there's the famous passage that the, uh, that the Catholics like to use, um, that they claim Peter is the first Pope because he says like on this rock, shall I build my church? Uh, which we can talk about that later, but <laughs> that's not what that, that's not what Jesus is saying. It's not that Peter is the first Pope. Um, the Catholic church wasn't started until Constantine in like the third or fourth century. So, um, now uh, there's one other thing one other thing that happens right after Jesus recognizes Peter. Well, after this, Jesus talks about how he is going, the son of man is going to be lifted up and put to death. Um, and then Peter tells him like, let it not be so Lord that he's basically telling him, no, like that doesn't need to happen. We can, we can do, we can handle this some other way. And then Right after that, Jesus rebukes Peter. <laughs> right after he recognizes him, quote unquote, praises him, then he rebukes Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God, but the things of men. So, um, so he is, he just got done rebuking Peter. And then after that, you get this passage where he says, uh, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So, um, the reason I wanted to mention that context is because I think it's relevant to why Jesus is saying this. Now, why is it relevant? Um, well, personally, this is just my opinion, but, um, I believe that Jesus was saying, uh, that Jesus was saying this because as a disciple of Christ, Peter, as well as the other, as well as the other disciples needed to realize the costliness of devoting their lives to Christ. They, um, there are some very significant rewards and losses at stake. Also, Jesus gives us a pattern, um, to follow through his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, there's lots of times where we're talked to where, uh, like in the epistles where it talks about crucifying the flesh and being crucified with, uh, with Christ. Um, and so we are told in, in many different ways, um, many different times throughout the new Testament, uh, it is instructed for believers and disciples to, uh, you know, to take up their cross and to follow, kind of follow the example of, Jesus crucifixion not literally I'm not, he's not telling people to go get crucified on a cross uh, by the Romans but uh, figuratively and there's different ways that you can that you can do that but um, 
but he gives us a pattern to follow uh, follow him through his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, and to avoid that pattern in our lives is basically to live a selfish and meaningless life, where anything gained will ultimately mean nothing at the end of our lives. Now, uh, there's three things... Um, other than other than just giving up our lives for the cause of Christ, which some many people have done historically, uh, been martyrs for Jesus Christ, uh, that doesn't happen as often, at least in um, in the Western world, in the United States and um, first world countries, it doesn't happen very often. But there's still some people being martyred for the cause of Christ in like the Middle East and. Uh, maybe in like communist countries like China and stuff like that, North Korea. Um, but, <clears throat> but there are three things, practically speaking, that we do have to sacrifice. That if you're not willing to sacrifice those things and, and give them up, then uh, you're not going to grow. And those three things are your time, your money, and your effort. So, uh, you're following Christ, if you're going to be a true disciple of Christ, it's going to cost you time, it's going to cost you effort, and it's going to cost you some money. Um, and I mean, and I'm not, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to say this, uh, I'm not trying to brag or be boastful at all or any, in anything like that. So don't let it, I don't want it to come across that way. But this, uh, this YouTube channel, I do this to try to help, um, new believers or believers that are interested in being discipled and growing. Uh, I do it so that you guys can try to grow and so that you can, um, you know, develop and transform in your Christian lives. But, uh, this is, this is something that I do in my own time and I'm not getting paid for it. I, I don't, I haven't gained a single penny from this so far. Um, and that's not, that's not what I'm, uh, wanting to do here necessarily. Now, if I could eventually grow this channel to, to where it, I could get some support through donations and things like that, that would be great. But, um, but I'm just saying that, um, kind of as an example, like you have to be willing to give up something, whether it's your time, uh, your money, some effort. Um, uh, and, uh, it, if you're, if you're not willing to give up anything like that and you're just going to sit, uh, you know, just get that fire insurance, believe on Jesus Christ, and then sit back for the rest of your life and not worry about anyone but yourself, uh, that is, that's the opposite of discipleship. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. If you, if you're truly wanting to be my disciples, you know, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. You're going to have to sacrifice. Um, and many, most of the disciples did literally have to sacrifice their lives. It wasn't like us just sacrificing time, money, and effort. Uh, they literally gave up their lives except for, um, John who, I mean, he basically almost did give up his life, um, as a martyr, but God miraculously saved him from that. And I think from what we can gather through history and stuff, um, it seems like he died of natural causes for the most part. Um, so, uh, let's go on to, there's another passage here we're going to look at, uh, that deals with discipleship. And this is probably one of the most famous ones that people like to use for, like, lordship salvation, like, trying to defend that. Um, and we're going to get into that in a little bit later. But let's read Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. It says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that uh, 
all that behold it begin to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish it or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him or with twenty thousand or else while the other is yet a great way off he sendeth an ambassage and desireth desireth conditions of peace so likewise whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath he cannot be my disciple so um in this one i don't know if it actually said um let me go back here and look at it so he didn't in the last passage we read in matthew he didn't li literally say you know that you have to do these to be my my disciple but this is uh he mentions that a couple times in this passage here in luke that if you're going to be my disciple you know you have to lay all these things aside uh basically in comparison to your devotion to him um in, in comparison to your love for him you should hate your your father your mother your wife your brother sister all those things uh, and he's not l saying literally that we hate them um, but I think the best way that I've heard this described is that basically if it came down to them saying you have to choose between me or choose between your God um, that without hesitation you should choose your God or choose to follow Christ and I think that's what it what it's coming down to so if it costs you a relationship if it costs you a marriage if it costs your your relationship with your parents with your siblings with your children um, or your spouse it, it doesn't matter um, if it comes to uh, them making you choose between them and between your faith in Christ you should follow follow Christ and I think that's what is um, I mean it's not it's not um, explicitly stated there but I think that's the best way I've heard it explained before and so again that's another uh, a pattern of sacrifice we have to be willing to sacrifice sometimes you have to sacrifice friends uh, there's countless stories of people who were living lives of sin and um, and we, I know we all live lives of sin, but um, I say that like in the sense of like they were basically um, living like reprobates, you know, going to maybe addicted to drugs and alcohol and, uh, you know, always sleeping around and things like that. And then someone gets saved out of that. They become a believer and then, you know... It, they have to choose between well do I want to go back to that lifestyle because my friends are not going to want to go to church with me my friends are not going to want to have Bible studies at my house or at each other's houses um, and sometimes those friends they uh, they can you know they they may try to pressure you into uh, leaving that faith stuff behind like just say, oh that stupid faith stuff you know you're into all that uh, imaginary fairy tale stuff from the Bible um, so you'll hear people say stuff like that to try to discourage you from following Christ and um, it, so there is a cost sometimes you have to lay down certain friendships and relationships for the cause of Christ um, so yeah, um, sorry, someone just parked right beside me and, uh, I had to pause there for a second while they were getting out. Um, so where were we? Okay. Yeah. So there, there's a pattern of sacrifice that comes with following Christ. Um, I have some notes here, but I think we pretty much put um i pretty much just talked about that so i don't think i need to go into further detail um here's just a couple more references that i'll list really quickly um 
about discipleship. In John 13, verse 35, it says, By this shall by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So, uh, this is a descriptor of what a disciple should be known by. So you should be known for your love of others. Of, uh, and, you know, what is the, it makes me think of like the greatest commandment. To love your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And I know this says your love one for another as in uh loving your brothers in christ but i think it also applies to loving your neighbor and your enemy because that's a command as well like in um <clears throat> in the sermon on the mount i think it's like matthew five forty four or something like that where he talks about loving your enemies um so we should be known by our love um and a lot of christians a lot of Christians really give Christianity a bad name because we think, a lot of times we think that we have to be known by having all the right beliefs, um, you know, having a, a statement of faith that is, uh, you know, 100% biblical. And I'll, I'll just give you a newsflash. <laughs> There's no statement of faith out there that's 100% biblical uh, because... You know, there are a lot of things in the Bible that, uh, and, a thing, and things about God that we just don't know. Our, a statement of faith, or a confession, or a creed, or anything like that, even the most accurate one out there, you know, you could have one that maybe is not false at all, that doesn't say anything false about God, or, or, um, or salvation, or anything like that. Maybe it doesn't have any incorrect stuff about it, but just think of the best one that you could think of, like maybe the Apostles' Creed or something like that. Well, compared to God and his wisdom and his knowledge and his infinitude, um, saying, reciting something like that um, or any, any kind of statement of faith that you could come up with, it's like baby talk in comparison to uh, in, in comparison to the infinitude of God. It would be like uh, like I have a seven month old well she's about to be eight months old daughter and she's right now she's saying things like I mean she's not saying words but before she would say like da 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 and you know I pretend like she's saying da da <laughs> but um Right now she's in a phase of saying like na 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 na, and that's basically in comparison to everything that God is and all the wisdom that's contained in Scripture, uh, and just the vastness of God. Basically anything that we can come up with, like a statement of faith or a creed or anything like that, um, is just like that baby talk. It's just like. Uh, my daughter saying those words that don't mean anything in comparison to that. Uh, so, um, I think that we, we often prioritize the wrong things in, you know, trying to be, trying to be scriptural and trying to be good Christians. You know, we try to make sure that we're having all the right beliefs when the Bible says that by this, uh, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And do we really have love one for another? Um, and this is, this is a stab at myself, if anything else. I mean, um, with all the, all the times maybe that I've said negative things about other, um, other denominations or other tribes within Christianity and stuff, a lot of times we have this us versus them mentality and I'm as guilty of it as anyone else. So I'm not trying to like virtue signal or anything here. Um, but I'm just trying to get us to think and grow as Christians. Um, here's another verse here about disciples. It says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So if you're a true disciple, you will bear fruit one way or another. Now, 
I didn't say believer. And remember, none of those verses said if you are saved or if you're a believer or anything like that. So let's get that let's get that thought out of your head because um, that's not what the Bible says. It's uh, those are descriptors of discipleship. All those passages that we just read. So um, a lot of you may be thinking at this point, well. That still doesn't explain um, how come there's so many times in Scripture where it says it, um, it makes no distinction between disciples and just believers that are not disciples. Well, um, let's let's first look at an example of disciples. So I said earlier there can be some people that are just disciples, not believers. There can be people who are just believers and not disciples. And there should be those of us who are um, who are following Christ and trying to live for him should be both the believers and disciples. Uh, and here's an example of some who were disciples but evidently not believers. So in John chapter 6 verses 64 through 66. It says, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So, here... Jesus says that there are some of you, and he's talking to disciples, he's talking to a big group of disciples here, and he says there are some of you who believe not, and then he sa it says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and, that, and who should betray him. And then some, some people will say that when it's saying those who believe not and those who, be who would betray him, that those are two different categories of people, uh, in, in a sense they are. But like, uh, like we said earlier, it doesn't mean they're mutually exclusive. So, um, and here when it's talking about those who would betray him, obviously we know that that's Judas. And some people will say, well, Judas was a believer when he said he knew those who would who didn't believe him and those who would betray him. Um, and they they try to categorize it differently, like the. Uh, Judas was a believer, but he also betrayed him. And I don't think that's the case because Jesus said, what, what, what was it that he actually said? He said, but there are some of you that believe not. And then it goes after, it doesn't say there are some of you that believe not and some that will betray me. He didn't say that. That's what John, John described what Jesus was, why he said that. And when John describes why he said that, it says, because he knew from the beginning who who didn't believe him and who would betray him those were both included in what Jesus was saying that um, that there are some of you who believe not so and I think that was a little bit of a rabbit trail but um, but needless to say uh, there was a whole lot a whole lot of disciples that just left Jesus after this statement. It says in verse 66 that from this from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So it's um we just got done talking he just got done talking about that many of you believe not or some of you believe not. And it says many of them after that point didn't walk anymore with him. So it's evident that those people who stopped following him weren't really true believers in him uh, but they were disciples they were following him the Bible call it straight up calls them disciples it says that those disciples walked no more with him and then we know that Judas was a disciple the Bible calls him a disciple multiple times but we can gather from this passage that he wasn't a believer so just remember uh, disciples and believers, those words 
are not mutually exclusive. You can be a disciple and a believer. You should be a disciple and a believer, but they're not always mutually exclusive. You may be just a disciple and you might not be a believer. You might not really be saved. Maybe you didn't really put your trust in Christ. You might be trusting in your works or, um, you know, just thinking that you inherited salvation because your parents were, were Christians. But that's not what the Bible says. It says that you have to place your trust in Christ. It says that you must be saved. You must be born again. So, um, let's go on and... And then, so there's the other, the other side of the coin here. Are there any scriptural, are there any scriptural examples of believers who weren't disciples? And I have um, a verse listed, or a couple verses listed here. John chapter eight verses twenty eight through thirty four, which say, "Then Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man." Then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. I, sp I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Um, now I included that last, those last couple of verses for context, which we're going to explain that in a second. Um, now this passage is, um, I, I will say before I discuss my thoughts on it, that there are, uh, there is a debate on whether it's when it says here those Jews that believed on him. There's a debate on whether or not those disciples or, or those um, not disciples because it doesn't he doesn't say that they are disciples but those Jews who believed on him if they were really saved or, or maybe not saved because the Holy Spirit wasn't yet given to regenerate people at that point um, but were they truly believing on him as the Messiah or were they just maybe understanding what he said and just believed uh, at that point in time and while there is a debate on that um, I just, I would just like to say, um, anytime that there's, some people will say, okay, well, those people, maybe they believed, but they didn't have saving faith. You know, there's no place in scripture that makes a distinction between faith and saving faith. Um, anytime that faith is mentioned in scripture, uh, it is implied that that person is also saved that they're born again um and i know some of you are probably thinking of james chapter 2 which if that if that's coming up or if that's coming up in your mind go watch my video on james chapter 2 and i'll explain that to you there um but uh but the bible never makes a distinction between uh, it, it never implies that faith does not accompany salvation um, it's it's always implied that when someone has faith in Christ that they are born again that they are saved um, and so the controversy I think comes in after Jesus says this when it says they answered him and the big question is who is they that is mentioning there in verse uh, I think it's verse 33 um, so whenever uh, yeah, whenever that word is used, a lot of people will say, well, uh, you know, right after Jesus said, what did he say here? He said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So it's implied that these people, right after it says that Jesus said unto the Jews that believed, 
if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. So he's implying that they were not yet disciples or that it's maybe, um, that it's pen it's pending. We don't know yet if you're true disciples because, uh, you know, you just believed, but, um, and, and, you know, I, it's debatable. You could say that Jesus knew, um, because of his omniscience and everything like that. Uh, but just for the sake of the discussion, uh, it says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So we don't know at that point whether these people were going to be disciples or if they were just, just simply believing on him. Um, but then when it says that those people started, or it says they asked him, they started to question him. Well, who is they? Is that the people that just believed on him? Or was it the Pharisees that he was talking with in this passage, in this whole chapter, uh, that were questioning him previously in the chapter? And I I personally believe that it was those who he was talking to previously in the chapter that were questioning him. I believe it was them that were that started to question him again after he made this statement to those that believed. But... Um, it, I mean, it could go either way. You, We don't know for sure. But either way, um, I do believe that um, those people, when it says that they believed on him, I believe it means that they believed that he was the Messiah. So uh, it's implied that they believed, but they weren't disciples. Or maybe uh, we don't know if they were disciples at that point. Um, so just have a couple more things. Well, uh, there's one more thing I wanted to mention. So, um, there are a lot of places in scripture where we see that there are believers who don't wind up being disciples. Like go watch my video on the passage of this, uh, on, on the, the parable of the sower. If you haven't already watched that. Uh, that's a very clear example of um, describing people, four different categories of people. You have those who never believed, then you have those who believe for a short time, but then they stop believing whenever hard times come. Then there's those who believe, but uh, because of their love for uh, riches and the things of the world, materialism, basically things like that. Um, it says the word is choked out and they become unfruitful. So you have those that believe but are unfruitful. And then there's those who believe and are faithful and obedient. Um, that basically they become disciples. So only one out of four. And that should be an indicator um, that probably... So one out of four people. And that's probably not, not one out of four. But um, let's just say maybe one out of... Um, one out of 10 people maybe believes in the gospel. And that's probably being generous to say that. But let's just say um, that one out of 10 people believes in the gospel and gets saved. Um, it's probably about, I would say probably only about one out of 10 of the people that actually believe in the gospel probably actually wind up committing their lives to Jesus. I mean, it's just, um, it's very uncommon for people to, um, to live their lives in complete devotion for Christ. Um, and I think that's just because we have a lack of, um, maybe a lack of knowledge of, or a lack of desire to, to learn from the word of God and things like that. Um, but, and probably a lack of, um, you know, people that are teaching it properly and stuff. There's a lot of factors that play into it. But anyway, let, we need to wrap this video up. So uh, basically, for the end of this, I just want to talk about why, why does the distinction matter? Uh, so I, I'm just going to read my notes here. So I'm sorry I'm not looking right at the camera. But um, while the term disciple is often used in the place of believers in several passes, uh, 
passages throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts, we don't actually, um, we don't want to assume that every disciple is a believer or that every believer is a disciple because uh, that is clearly, that's never clearly stated in scripture. And as we've seen, there are some examples where those are not mutually exclusive. Um, and then uh, another thing to consider is that you won't see the word disciple used in any of the epistles after the book of Acts. Uh, so the word disciple, I think it might be used one time in the Old Testament, but other than that, it's mostly just in the use in the New Testament. Um, but it stops using that term after the book of Acts. That's the, the book of Acts is the last one that you see that word disciple used. And, um, you know, we'll see other terms for believers such as, uh, you know, believers was one of them. Uh, and then brethren or apostles. Um, there might be some other terms that I, uh, that I haven't, that I'm not aware of, but we don't hear that word being used in the epistles. Like when Paul's, uh, reaching out or, uh, writing to other believers, he usually calls them brethren or things like that. Um, which implies that they are born again, you know, brothers in Christ. But, um, but I think that's, I think that's an important distinction or important thing to consider when thinking about this. Uh, so, and then the last thing here is we are not saved by works or by following or committing our lives to Jesus. The Bible never says that, um, that that's what saves us. The only thing the Bible ever says that saves us in the eternal sense is by placing our faith or trust in Christ. Um, and then this is just a, um, this is not a Bible verse again, uh, but this is something that I think the idea comes from scripture and it's just something, a, a saying or a, um, something that I like to, to keep in my mind that kind of keeps the idea of salvation clear and that is that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone I'm gonna say that one more time salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone um, and then one more thing is that discipleship is commitment to follow someone in faithful obedience and that is never listed as a requirement to be saved in scripture. Um, anyway, I appreciate you watching this. I know this has been a longer, a longer video. Uh, I didn't intend for it to go this long, but I think maybe, uh, it happened for a reason. So, uh, if you enjoyed this, I would just appreciate it. If you'd give it a thumbs up, uh, comment your thoughts, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. And if there's anyone that you think this video might help, just share it. And I would appreciate that. Um, and again, thank you. And I hope you all have a great day. God bless.